focus on the war itself and highlights a few of the battles and campaigns of the war uh, that ultimately lead to the defeat of the Confederacy, although by no means is that um, you know, people necessarily are confident of that when the war first gets started. Um, so the war begins officially with uh, the bombing of Fort Sumter, which was a fort in Charleston, South Carolina. Uh, as the first state to secede, um, the Confederates wanted the Union Army to withdraw from that fort uh, because it was no longer part of the United States, according to the South Car uh, Carolina you know, group. Obviously, the Union refused. The Union Army refused to secede because uh, refused to leave. I'm sorry, because it you know was still American territory, uh, and so the Confederate military opened fire on the fort. Uh, and this attack on Fort Sumter and the fact that it was the Confederates who first fired, not the Americans, not the Unions, um, is what united those northern states together uh, and led to the, that the, led to the um, early calls for military enlistment uh, to be met very enthusiastically, right? Lots of people signed up uh, willingly um, after this happened. Uh, once this happens, four more southern states secede, Virginia, Arkansas, Tennessee, and North Carolina. Uh, we mentioned this a little bit in the last lecture video, right, but the issue for President Lincoln and the Republican Party was how do we keep those few remaining states in the Union that do allow slavery? So at this point it was Maryland, Delaware, Missouri, and Kentucky that still allowed slavery but had not yet seceded. And so the idea was that uh, if Lincoln supported immediate abolition, that those four states would then also secede, and that would make things a lot more difficult um, for the, uh, the Union Army, especially since if Maryland and uh, Virginia had both seceded, then Washington D.C., the capital, would be fully surrounded by enemy territory. And so Lincoln decides to kind of put aside the issue of slavery uh, and focuses just on uniting the nation around preserving the Union, right, preserving the United States of America. And so based on these images, right, these charts, you might think that there should have been a short war, right? The, the North had a much larger population, um, many more people eligible for the military, um, many more industrial workers to make weapons. They had a larger military, uh, greater military strength. So kind of going into the war, uh, many Northerners did think this was going to be a short conflict that would end quickly. Uh, and the plan that the Union Army and the Union, you know, the United States put forward uh, has became known as the Anaconda Plan. Um, and just like an Anaconda, right, as the, the political cartoon shows us there on the right, uh, it would kind of, the goal was to encircle the Confederacy and kind of strangle them, like a snake kills its prey by strang you know, circling it, wrapping around it, and strangling it, right? And that was the idea behind it. So there was kind of three parts to this. First was that the Union was gonna have a naval blockade of southern ports, right? So having the Navy block off any access in and out of ports, say like Charleston or New Orleans. Um, in addition, the Union would have riverboats to sail down the Mississippi to split that Confederacy into two. So going back here, the Mississippi River, runs along here. So if they have Union boats here, it would block off states like Arkansas, Texas, and Louisiana from places like Mississippi, Alabama, and Tennessee. And finally, to kind of put an end to the war, the Union Army needed to capture the Confederate capital, which was Richmond, Virginia. Right, so Richmond, Virginia is not too far off from Washington, D.C. It's down here on this part of the map, um, near the York Peninsula, and that was the idea, the goal behind it. Uh, and so the first battle was almost treated as like a show. Um, it was the Battle of Bull Run. Uh, many people from D.C. actually kind of rode out to see and witness the battle as if it was like a, an outing, a picnic thing, right? Um, unfortunately, the North was uh, underestimated its, its enemy, um, and the Confederates actually kind of win that battle. They force um, General Thomas Stonewall Jackson um, to retreat and that was in July of 1861. And this is kind of the first indication that this will in fact not be a short war, uh, but might be a much longer. So in, around this time, right, President Lincoln begins to call for a million men to enlist in the army to make sure they can, and to ensure they can defeat the Confederacy. Um, and there are kind of two armies, or two, two major groups of the Union Army at this point. There's the Army of the Potomac, uh, which the Potomac River runs through Washington, D.C. So they were kind of going to deal with, um, the Army of the Potomac was meant to deal with the fighting near and around Washington, D.C. and Virginia, um, you know, North Carolina, maybe that part of the country. Uh, it was led by a man named, at first, uh, a man named General George McClellan, um, who we're going to see is not as effective as people had hoped he would be. Then the western 
part of the nation at the time uh, was put under the, the armies on that side of the of the battle were put under the leadership of a man named Ulysses S. Grant, who will be a future president of the United States. And so earlier in the war, <coughs> the Western Union armies under Grant have more success than the Potomac Army, Army of the Potomac under McClellan. Uh, in February of 1862, for example, uh, Ulysses S. Grant helps to capture strategic Confederate forts in Tennessee. Um, and kind of helps kind of make some progress on that end. There is uh, one battle that, this famous battle, the Battle of Shiloh, also in Tennessee, uh, which was very deadly, uh, 25,000 casualties, so that's injuries and deaths, uh, and it was essentially a draw. No one progressed either way, the Union or the Confederacy. But what this does show us is that it comes to show the violence and destruction of this war. The Civil War is a very bloody conflict, and it's one of the first wars the United States engages in that's more of a modern war, um, which we'll talk about um, shortly. Um, in addition, right, the, the other part of the Anaconda plan here, controlling the ports. So a Union fleet of 40 naval ships under a man named David Farragut uh, captured many important cities relatively early on, like New Orleans and that one, for example, in April 1862. So having access and control of the port cities is important because now the Confederacy can't get needed supplies from other people and other nations, or at least it's harder to do that. Um, Going back to the point I made about the modern warfare, uh, one new example of this was new ships. They were called ironclad ships, right, because they were fully made of iron and, and metal. Uh, and they revolutionized naval warfare because they're much stronger than, um, they're much stronger than a, a wooden ship, right? They're not powered, they're powered by oil and coal and, and, and engines, right, not just sails as well. So it revolutionizes the naval warfare. Uh, there's a famous ironclad battle that takes place in the Atlantic off the coast of Charleston, South Carolina. Uh, between the USS, the United States, the Union uh, ship, the Monitor, which was actually made in the Brooklyn Navy Yard, uh, so a little bit of local history thrown in there, and the CSS, or the Confederate ship, uh, Merrimack. Um, the Monitor managed to prevent the Merrimack from breaking through that Union blockade around Charleston. Both ships are pretty severely damaged, uh, but the Monitor is kind of seen as uh, an, er an early naval success for the, the Union. And it highlights, again, the modern warfare, right, the new technology that's going to transform war, not just in the Civil War, but in future wars that happen as well. Right, this kind of an illustration showing you the two kind of battling each other out um, compared to the old wooden sail ships around it. Elaborating more on this uh, idea of modern military, um, modern weapons, right? There's changing technology and even changing strategies to the conflict and how to fight war. So rifles are used over muskets. Rifles can be reloaded much more quickly. Um, they can fire more than one shot at a time, right? And so they're much more effective. They have better aim uh, than the old-fashioned muskets that might have been used or were used in the uh, Revolutionary War. Cannon fire was no longer just giant kind of lead cannonballs that could do damage to buildings and structures, or if it hit you directly, it could do damage, right? Um, but now instead they use shrapnel, right, which is tiny shards of metal um, that when it's fired out, explodes and kind of go everywhere. So this can be much more deadly because these tiny pieces are almost like mini bullets right, that can pierce several different people and hurt several different people instead of just a few. Right? Uh, the shrapnel and, and new weapons made the traditional charge that you might see if you ever watch The Patriot, for example, which is about the Revolutionary War, where you know the two sides line up and they charge at each other, right? Uh, that becomes not effective anymore because the guns are much more effective and the shrapnel can kill many, many more people. And so new ways of fighting have to develop, right? Trench warfare, uh, strategic storming, right? And, and, and things like that have to be, to be used. Uh, the kind of trying to use aerial technology to better understand enemy movements um, is established first with the, you know, the use of hot air balloons, right? And eventually as history goes on, right, we get into World War I and World War II, it's not hot air balloons, obviously, it's going to be uh, airplanes. Uh, and the telegraph also offers an opportunity for much more rapid communication, right? So Ulysses S. Grant, for example, can much more quickly communicate with McClellan uh, back in, in, in Washington uh, if needed, right? So it kind of allows people like Lincoln to follow almost like real time, as we would call today, updates on, on the conflicts and battles and, and campaigns that were happening. Um, I mentioned earlier that General McClellan was a hesitant leader. Uh, he was nervous to kind of uh, forward, you know, be on the offense. Um, 
and it takes him until the spring of 1862, so a full year into the conflict, for him to finally begin marching towards Richmond, Virginia, which is the Confederate capital, another key part of that Anaconda plan that we mentioned. Uh, he's met by the forces led by General Robert E. Lee. Uh, Lee is the major Confederate general, uh, the leader of the Confederate Army, and a, a very talented military leader who was actually a, a, a Union general uh, or, or, or military leader in the uh, Mexican-American War. He was a West Point graduate, uh, very accomplished, and was a very respected person by many people in the Union, um, but he led the, Rebe the rebel army. Uh, so his unorthodox, ta unorthodox tactics kind of caught McClellan off guard. Uh, he's forced to retreat then away from Richmond. Um, and on the offensive then, he wins the second Battle of Bull Run. So twice here, the Confederates defeat the Union at Bull Run. Um, he then crosses the Potomac into Antietam, which is a, bat which is a city in Maryland. Um, and this is one of only two times that the conflict moves out of the Confederate territory and into Northern Union territory. So Antietam uh, in Maryland was the bloodiest single day battle in American history. Uh, it was a draw, neither side wins, um, but 20,000 people were, were killed. Uh, the South lost a quarter of its men and they were kind of forced to retreat. Uh, the reason why it's considered a draw though is that because McClellan refuses to pursue them. He stops advancing as well, uh, which many claim is a serious shortcoming of McClellan that if he had perhaps pursued them, he could have ended the war years earlier. Uh, so November then 1862, um, President Lincoln fires George McClellan and uh, he is no longer in charge of that side. This is a really cool photograph here showing you Lincoln, um, I believe with George McClellan, um, in a tent on the, on the campaign, at the campaign, at the battles. So the South in 1863 has some successes and some tragedies, some you know uh, failures. Uh, they defeat Northern troops at Chancellorsville in Virginia. Again, um, kind of that's the Army of the Potomac not doing as well. Um, Southern patrols mistook their famous general, General Stonewall Jackson, who was kind of a major important general in the South, as a Yankee, as a Northerner, and so they actually shot him in the arm, uh, which was amputated, but because of the medicine and the, the signs at the time, uh, was not done cleanly or properly. He catches pneumonia and he dies. Um, and because of this, General Lee then needs, feels like he needs to kind of reinvigorate the morale after the death of his key figure. And so he, he decides to um, march into the Union again. And the, the Union troops then meet um, Lee and his Confederates at Gettysburg in Pennsylvania. And this is probably one of the most famous um, battles in American history, in Civil War history. It's in July of 1863. It was a three-day battle with over 20,000 casualties on both sides. Um, bodies were strewn everywhere in, in the hot summer of July, right? Many of them were rotting and, and decaying. Uh, and it was horrible smelling, right? It was a terrible, it was a terrible scene. Uh, the battles kind of go back and forth um, with Confederates kind of advancing one day, being pushed back the other, and then the third day, finally, General Robert E. Lee is forced to retreat out of Gettysburg. And this is really important because if they had won in Gettysburg, there then would be a Confederate presence in the Union, right? And that's, that's a serious issue. Uh, it's the last time, though, after this that the Confederate Army is able to ever try to advance and invade into the North. Uh, and so many actually see Gettysburg as a turning point in the Civil War. And from that point on, it becomes clearer and clearer that the Union is going to win this conflict. Kind of a famous uh, portrait here of the, of the battle at Gettysburg in Pennsylvania. Um, and the kind of successes for the Union keep building. Uh, there's two remaining Confederate ports by this point in 1863 on the Mississippi River, one of them being Vicksburg in Mississippi. Uh, and after two months, um, Grant then lays siege to this city. And after two months of laying siege and like surrounding it, essentially the Confederate soldiers begin to starve and they're forced to surrender. So July 4th, a symbolic day, of course, in 1863, which is one day also after the Union victory at Gettysburg, the Union captures Vicksburg. So there's two major successes for the Union, Get Gettysburg and Vicksburg, back to back in the year 1863. Uh, and then the last Confederate port on Mississippi was a, a, a port called Port Hudson, which also falls to the Union forces shortly after this. So now, by this point, by 1863, the Confederate Army has been pushed twice out of the North, uh, and every single port city on the Mississippi River is now under the control of the Union. This causes Confederate morale to collapse, um, and so now the new strategy was to just hold off long enough for an armistice, for a, a ceasefire. 
uh, but the Union continues to progress. So in March 1864, Lincoln appoints General Ulysses S. Grant as the head of the entire Union Army, not just the Western armies. Uh, and the General William Tecumseh Sherman, General Sherman, was appointed commander of the Union forces in Mississippi. <coughs> so Grant then leads a force, uh, leads his forces against Lee in Virginia, try, again trying to capture Richmond. Um, and there are heavy casualties on both sides, but the Confederacy is losing kind of, they don't have people back up anymore, whereas the North does. Uh, Sherman then continues to march into the heartland of the Confederacy, fighting all along the way. By 18, September of 1864, Sherman has captured Atlanta, Georgia, so now he's in the Deep South. Um, and so he employs a scorched earth approach, right? As he goes, he kind of burns everything, destroys railroad tracks, all these things to make sure the South is completely decimated um, as he goes. Uh, and from once he goes from Mississippi through into Georgia, he then turns his attention further to north again, Sherman, and he meets um, Grant to help the campaign against Lee in Virginia. So this map kind of shows you all those things happening, right? Sherman's marched here, right, uh, into Georgia, and then north through South Carolina and North Carolina into Richmond. Uh, Lincoln feared he would lose the war because uh, lose the, the election of 1864 because he had been, you know, responsible for this long war with a lot of casualties. However, leading up to Election Day, there were several more key successes for the Union Army that work in his favor. Uh, for example, the Union captures Mobile, Alabama. They take control of the Shenandoah Valley in Virginia. Um, and then shortly after his inauguration in March 1865, when he wins re-election, the Confederates surrender Richmond, Virginia, the capital. And on April 9th, um, 1865, Grant and Lee meet at the Appomattox Courthouse. Uh, where they, where the Confederacy formally surrenders uh, and the Civil War comes to an end. Unfortunately, five days later, Abraham Lincoln is assassinated by John Wilkes Booth, uh, which kind of throws everything back up in the air and, and makes kind of what might have happened after the war um, very different from what actually does happen. So we'll end with this image here showing the surrender of General uh, Robert E. Lee on the left um, and Grant there on the right.